Dad once advised me about relationships, emphasizing the importance of self-respect and integrity. He said, a man of worth doesn't tolerate disrespect, manipulation, or dishonesty from his partner. Stay authentic to yourself and uphold your values. Sweetheart, there's been a sudden change of plans. The merger meeting has been rescheduled, and I must leave early tomorrow morning. I won't be back until late Sunday. I understand the significance of the wedding, especially with your role as the maid of honor. However, my recent promotion to CFO demands my presence at this meeting. I apologize deeply for any inconvenience. Seriously? We've been planning this for ages, and now, at the 11th hour, you're canceling? I'll be left alone there. Have you considered how embarrassing that'll be for me? Can't someone else represent you? Vera, this deal is worth over $2 billion, and I'm leading it. We've worked hard on it for the past year, and there's no one else who can take my place. Many people's jobs depend on our success. I know it's tough, and I'll make it up to you with the bonus we'll get from this deal. I understand you're upset, but there's nothing I can do. I'll be back Sunday. Needless to say, she was furious. She stopped talking to me and told me to sleep in the guest room. No intimacy or sex before my trip. That wasn't usual, her coldness and anger were unlike her. I tried to understand but couldn't ease her anger, so I packed for my trip and spent the night in the guest room. I knew the wedding meant a lot to her because of her friend Carol's struggles. Carol's ex-husband cheated on her during her life-threatening illness and left her because he couldn't handle her slow recovery. It devastated Carol and worsened her situation. But after making a miraculous recovery, Carol filed for divorce due to abandonment and battled depression for the next five years. All of her friends and family were there for her, trying to lift her spirits, but nothing seemed to work. Then one day, she met a man at the grocery store, and suddenly her world brightened, and she returned to her old self. Her friends' and family's prayers were answered, and everyone wanted to celebrate the joyful occasion. Brandon, her fiancé, adored her deeply and organized a magnificent wedding. Vera, her closest friend and maid of honor, stood by her side throughout. I knew how important this was to Vera, and I regretted having to cancel, but I was helpless. I knew I had to make it up to her and endure her anger before leaving for my trip the next morning. I tried to give Vera a goodbye kiss, but our bedroom door was locked, and she didn't open it. I expressed my love for her and promised to call from Germany upon landing. Sadly, I walked to the waiting limo that took me to the airport. I felt terrible and unhappy about her reaction, not understanding my predicament. After 19 years of marriage, I expected more understanding and compassion. I called her before my flight, but her phone went to voicemail. I left another apology message, hoping for a response. I sent a text before takeoff and another upon landing 10 hours later, but received no reply. I knew she was angry, and I realized I would need to apologize profusely to regain her favor. With no other options, I contacted our twin daughters at college, explaining the situation and asking them to check on their mom and ensure she was okay. I emphasized my worry and the importance of hearing back from them to ease my concerns. They understood and expressed their love for me. They've always been daddy's girls, and I cherish them deeply. When I arrived in Germany and checked into the hotel, I called my CEO for an update, only to discover to my horror that the meeting had been cancelled due to the other company's CEO experiencing a family death. I immediately contacted the airlines and secured a direct flight to Chicago O'Hare, which was just 30 minutes away from the reception venue. Since the wedding reception was set to begin at 7 p.m., I estimated that I could arrive by 9 p.m. and be a supportive husband. I believed this gesture would bring her happiness. After I got the rental car, the GPS helped me find my way to the reception hall. It was just after 9 p.m. when I got there, and the party was already in full swing. The place was alive with loud music, dancing, and plenty of drinks, with many guests clearly having a great time and some a bit too much to drink. I was happy to be there and looked forward to seeing my wife again. With more than 200 people there, it wasn't easy to find Vera at first, so I went to the bar, got myself a double bourbon, and started looking around for her. Thinking back on our journey together, I remembered that Vera was older than me by five years and had just gone through a divorce when we first met. Her former husband, Dr. Clayton Adams, was doing his residency at Mercy Hospital when their marriage ended because he was unfaithful with a nurse from his workplace. Vera had thrown him out, heartbroken over his dishonesty. She had dreamed of a life filled with children and joy, but those dreams were crushed by her ex-husband's cheating. The divorce hit her hard 
both emotionally and financially, since medical residents don't make much money. The settlement split what little they had. Vera started working as a waitress to pay her bills. Facing tough times head-on, this experience gave her a deep understanding of what Carol was going through. When Vera and I first met, it was like a storybook romance. I was instantly smitten despite her past hurt and sadness. I saw in her a valuable treasure. Her beauty initially caught my attention, but it was her kindness and compassion that truly won me over. I supported her through her challenges, helping to transform her life for the better. Together, we spent 19 beautiful years raising our twin daughters with abundant love. Vera appreciated my honest and direct way of handling our relationship. We frequently talked about how important being loyal and committed was, which gave her a sense of security. I emphasized my respect for loyalty and my intolerance for infidelity, praising her for having the courage to leave her cheating husband. Her resilience in moving past that difficult time was something I deeply admired. Our marriage was built on trust, loyalty, and commitment, values that held us together until the unexpected incident at the wedding. At the age of 44, Vera was still stunningly beautiful, and I, being five years her junior, was in top form thanks to my dedication to fitness and running at 39. I felt like I was in the prime of my life. Our intimate relationship was strong, and the age difference between us never posed a problem. Our twin daughters, Marcia and Carrie, were flourishing in college, full of life and excited about their futures. We had a happy, loving family in a marriage that seemed unbreakable. That was until I saw Vera at the wedding, sitting alone with Clayton, her former husband. I knew Clayton was friends with the bride, Carol, but his presence at the wedding, especially without his wife, was something I hadn't anticipated. Feeling tired from my travel and curious about what I was witnessing, I paused to watch them closely, noticing how friendly they appeared together despite their history. I chose to hang back for a bit to get a better sense of how they were interacting. It wasn't long before I felt like my world was beginning to fall apart. I was just about to step in and break up their cozy moment when she suddenly stood up, took his hand, and led him to the dance floor. Vera looked incredible in her fitted ivory dress, and I desperately hoped this was nothing more than a dance. Her confidence as they moved together through several slow songs caught me off guard. Nursing my drink, I stayed back to watch how things would develop. It was clear that Vera had been drinking, as her flirty behavior gave her away, which I knew could happen. She'd often get more affectionate and playful with me after a few drinks, which was usual for her. However, what was not usual or acceptable was her kissing another man openly, especially in front of her friends, fully aware that she was my wife. This act of betrayal made me feel both humiliated and furious. Watching my wife share intimate moments and seeing him daringly touch her inappropriately and exchange kisses with her left me in utter shock and anger. I got really mad, and just as I was about to step in and stop it, they moved her back to the table off to the side and began kissing like they were. On their honeymoon. I could plainly see his hands on her chest and her hand under the table. Right before I was going to step up to them, I realized my marriage was done for. I remembered what my dad always said, hey, respect yourself, guys. Don't put up with being treated badly. So, I decided to do something, but I kept it cool. I could have caused a big fuss, ruined the perfect wedding, stopped them, and made sure it didn't go any further. But then I thought, if she's into him, she can have him. She's not mine anymore. Feeling oddly calm, I took out my phone, zoomed in, and snapped a bunch of close-up pictures and a short video. Then I texted her, guess what, sweetheart? My meeting got pushed, and I'm back early. Seems like you're in good hands tonight. I'll head back home. Guessing you'll be staying the night with Dr. Clayton. Got it now why you've been ignoring my calls and texts. Have a blast and cheers to our marriage ending. I'll be gone by the time you come back tomorrow. I pressed send and watched calmly, curious. If she'd seen the message watching her, I saw her phone light up. She noticed picked it up, and started pressing buttons, clearly looking for the text. Vera sobered up fast, her face turning serious the moment she saw my message. As soon as I noticed her reaction, I left the party for my car. Vera must have freaked seeing me go, but I was outside before she could catch up. As I got into my car, I heard her yelling, Tony, please wait. I just gave her a cold look, shook my head, got in my car, and drove off before she could catch up. My phone started blowing up with calls but I was too upset to even think about picking up. If she wanted to go back to her ex, it was clear we were over. 
I mean, after catching them together, we were definitely done. 22 years since I left that cheater, and she runs back to him at the first chance. Guess she's got some explaining to do to our family and the kids because this mess is on her. My phone kept filling up with desperate texts. Tony, please come back, I need to explain, I love you, please come back. Damn it, Tony, it's not what you think, I love you. But after two days of long flights, no calls or texts back, her cold attitude, and seeing her with Clayton, I had no interest in hearing her out. I was as mad as I could be and wanted nothing to do with her or her excuses. After ignoring 20 calls and texts, I finally stopped and sent one text back. It said, forget you. I'm doing great with my job, my kids are off to college, and everything's paid for. I'm free to do as I please. I still had enough youth left to begin anew. After driving for four hours out of my seven-hour journey back to Nashville, I stopped at a diner to grab a meal and take a quick nap in the car before resuming my trip home. While enjoying my eggs and bacon, I decided to express my feelings to the world. At that time, Facebook was the go-to social media platform where everyone shared updates about their lives. Between bites, I changed my Facebook status from happily married to single and available. Then I uploaded two photos I had taken of Vera and Clayton sharing a passionate kiss at the wedding. In the second photo, his hand was clearly on her breast. Below the photo, I wrote that Vera was upgrading and reuniting with her ex-husband, while I was now back on the dating scene. It may have been immature, but to me, it was the truth. I was moving forward without her. The funny thing is, Clayton, her ex, was nearly 50, balding, overweight, and honestly, not an upgrade in any way. It's baffling why she ditched us for some old guy who'd already cheated on her over 20 years ago. Maybe she preferred a doctor over an accountant. Honestly, it hurt. It hurt a lot. I felt more pain then than I could ever remember. I felt sad and angry, but it also struck me as absurd. She's ending a 19-year marriage for an old guy who cheated on her over 20 years ago? Forget her and forget him. They're made for each other. I'm not the type to tolerate that kind of disrespect, some might say. It was just a kiss and some touching, not worth leaving her over. Well, in my book, either my woman is committed to me or she's free to be with someone else. We all make our choices. After my late breakfast and a two-hour nap in the car, I hit the road again, pulling into my driveway at 7 a.m. When I turned on my phone, it started dinging with dozens of notifications. So many came in that I didn't think they were ever going to stop. There had to be over a hundred messages from her, her parents, her sister, and friends within five minutes of turning on the phone. It started ringing, and I noticed it was Vera. I wondered if she got any sleep last night or if she spent it with Clayton. No matter, I just ignored her calls because I was past all that now, and only focused on getting what I need out of the house and moving on. I got along well with her family, and when they called me that morning, I took their call. I explained to her dad, James, what had happened. James, I had no idea that she was unhappy with our marriage, but cheating was the death blow to our happy life. The disrespect she showed in front of people we know is something I can't tolerate. It's clear she still has feelings for that jerk, so now she can be with him. I plan to find a woman who will value what I bring to the table and remain faithful. James, I have no other option. I'll move out today and put the house up for sale right away. Tomorrow morning, I'll contact a lawyer to start the divorce process. She can stay here until the house sells, and I'll ensure fairness in the divorce. Call me old-fashioned, but I won't live with a woman who wants someone else. She made her choice, but I don't think it was wise. James arrived over an hour later, pleading with me to wait and talk to her before taking drastic steps. But when he asked me to give her a chance to explain, I pointed to the photo again, showing how they openly fondled each other at the wedding. I couldn't tolerate that, especially with her ex. Her dad was disappointed in her actions and my quick decision-making. As I stepped into our home, I felt tears welling up, realizing that our once happy home was now just a hollow shell of our marriage. Over the past five years, we transformed our house into our ideal home. Back then, mortgage rates were below 2.99% and our home's value had doubled. Being the accountant, I opted to refinance the home at its full value, extracting nearly $500,000 in equity. I promptly established $200,000 trust funds for each of our daughter's college education, with a bit extra to kickstart their lives. The remaining $100,000 was invested in upgrading the house, turning it into a place we took great pleasure in and were proud of. 
Thanks to the lower interest rate, the monthly payment only increased by $700 compared to before we withdrew the equity. It was an obvious choice. Vera returned to work as a receptionist to cover the extra monthly cost. My salary was decent, nothing extravagant, but as the newly promoted CFO I'd be receiving stock options the following year, which would serve as our retirement fund. Vera never took an interest in our finances as long as her needs were met, trusting my financial expertise, and living comfortably. Although I attempted to explain the stock options several times, her lack of interest was evident, but it didn't bother me much. I looked forward to our future happily. This merger, coinciding with the end of my marriage, promised a bonus in stock options of around 40,000 shares if successful. I needed to wait several years to exercise the options, but the anticipation of the stock hitting $100 per share boosted my confidence in the future. Since the merger was delayed, the options wouldn't factor into the divorce settlement. I planned to file for irreconcilable differences and split our assets, which amounted to around $50,000 in our savings. We divide the proceeds from selling the house, but with it heavily mortgaged, there wouldn't be much to divide. At 44, Vera would leave with her car and $25,000. If she had stayed faithful, she could have enjoyed a loving life and a secure future. However, my anger and humiliation now overshadowed any affection or memories I had for her. All I wanted was revenge and for her to understand the magnitude of what she lost. I haven't seen Clayton for 20 years and seeing him again made me remember a lot of things, both happy and sad. He used to be my husband, and we had a good relationship until he was unfaithful, and that ended our marriage. We had a strong connection and were very close, but he wasn't as special to me as Tony. Tony, my current husband, is more attractive, a wonderful partner, and I really love him. However, I found myself with Clayton, letting him hold and kiss me, which I knew wasn't right. I kept flirting with him even though I knew I shouldn't. I think I had too much to drink and felt upset that Tony wasn't here with me. I should have stopped, but it felt nice. Clayton still seemed like my perfect match in some ways, and I thought a little flirting was harmless. Plus, Clayton is now single, and Tony didn't rearrange his plans to join me for this important wedding, so I felt I deserved some enjoyment. After Clayton kissed me again, I felt happy inside. His kisses reminded me of old times, and I felt excited while we danced closely in a private place. I thought a bit of kissing and closeness was okay since everyone else was also enjoying the party and probably wouldn't notice us. I planned to make things right with Tony later. Suddenly, I got a text on my phone while all my friends were around. It might be Tony checking on me, and then Tony's message said he was here. I couldn't see him at first, but then I thought I saw him leaving. I panicked, realizing I needed to explain myself, but worried he might have seen me with Clayton. In a rush of confusion, I told Clayton I needed to use the ladies' room. I rushed out of the wedding party, my heart racing. I spotted the exit door slowly swinging shut down the hall and hurried toward it, my high heels clicking against the floor. I recognized Tony immediately, and he had seen me with Clayton. I called out to him, begging him to wait, but he didn't respond. He just got into his car and left. I tried to follow him, but it was too late, his car was already pulling away. Now he's ignoring my calls and texts. I've sent him so many messages, but he hasn't replied to any. I'm really upset, and I can't say I don't understand why. After trying to reach him several more times, sending another 10 messages, my heart sank when I finally got a response from him, a harsh forget you. Two of my friends found me then, kneeling outside in the bitter cold, wondering what had gone wrong. When I told them everything, they were both shocked by what I had done and worried about what it meant for my marriage. They knew Tony well enough to know he wouldn't let this go easily. The next morning, back in Nashville at 10 a.m., I was packing up my things, sitting at the kitchen table. I savored one last cup of coffee in the house we had made our home, feeling a mix of sadness and anger. After finishing, I left the empty cup in the sink and wrote a brief note. In it, I instructed her not to call me and that we'd speak once the divorce papers were prepared. I didn't even sign the note. I just left my wedding ring on top of it as a final gesture before I departed for the final time. I opened my laptop and divided our funds. I also cancelled our joint credit card after clearing the balance. From today onward, she was responsible for herself. If she contested the divorce, she would have to handle all the bills alone. There was no way she could manage the mortgage and utilities alone. The house would sell quickly at the right price as it was in demand. If she agreed to the divorce, we could swiftly end this failed marriage, and she could return to 
her beloved client. I drove away from my former sanctuary into an unfamiliar, dark new world. Later, I heard from my friends at the wedding that Vera was devastated after I left. She couldn't stop crying until she eventually passed out from drinking too much and the exhaustion of her uncontrollable sobbing. Her friends were worried and felt terrible for her. They tried reaching out to me multiple times, leaving voicemails and texts to prevent her from ruining the wedding reception. They took her back to her hotel room, put her to bed, and checked on her several times throughout the night. When she woke up the next morning and realized what had happened, she repeatedly called me, begging for forgiveness and asking me to call her back. However, after witnessing her actions, I wanted nothing to do with her and ignored all her attempts to reach out. On Sunday morning, I woke up with a severe hangover and the fear of divorce looming over me. I flew home at noon, and my dad picked me up from the airport. Later, I found out that Tony had informed my dad that he wouldn't be able to pick me up and needed a ride himself. From the worried expression on my dad's face, I must have looked terrible. My dad was my source of strength, so when I saw him, I hurried over and hugged him, crying on his shoulder. Daddy, I messed up, I said, and I think Tony left me with a sorrowful expression. He gently comforted his upset daughter. I talked to him this morning, and it doesn't seem promising. You know Tony, what were you thinking? And with Clayton? I have no idea what came over me. I was drunk and mad at Tony for not coming to the wedding. I know I made a mistake, but he has to forgive me, Daddy. I didn't even sleep with him. Sweetheart, from the pictures I saw, it might as well have been the same. I'm not sure he's the forgiving type, especially knowing Tony. And just being with another man like that in those pictures was a betrayal to him. When I got home, I hoped to find Tony waiting, but deep down, I knew he was long gone. I spent the day in tears, trying to call Tony, hoping to apologize. The irony struck me hard when I realized I had cheated on Tony with the same man who had betrayed me years ago. Tony, the man I loved and cherished, seemed to have vanished in an instant, a fact confirmed by his wedding ring left on the table with a short note. Meanwhile, I relocated to the company's condo meant for visiting clients since it wasn't booked. I informed my CEO about my situation, and he approved my stay there. My boss, Bill, who's also a good friend, went through a similar situation years ago. He even advised me to postpone receiving this year's stock options to a later date for better advantage. The following day, I went to my office on the 16th floor, knowing well that Vera wouldn't be able to get past security to see me. I had already made it clear to the security team that if she tried to come, they should politely escort her out. They did their job well, and when Vera attempted to visit on Monday, she quickly realized that she wouldn't be able to see or talk to me at work. Despite her efforts, I was determined to have no contact with her. She was left in the dark, not knowing where I was staying and unable to reach me by phone, feeling isolated, regretful, and fearful about what lay ahead for her. Amidst this, my daughters reached out to me in a panic, urging me to speak with their mother. I explained to them firmly but calmly that their mother had chosen to be with someone else, and that act was, to me, a clear betrayal. I made it clear how seriously I take infidelity. Before they could argue, I stressed that what their mother did amounted to cheating in my eyes. My daughters understood my stance and respected my decision. I tried to make them understand that their mother's choices had consequences and our divorce was inevitable. However, I reassured them that I would always be there for them and wanted them to remain a part of my life. I also imparted a lesson, hoping they would remember to always respect their future spouses and understand the gravity of betrayal, as many wouldn't tolerate such disrespect. After I shared a post on Facebook, a lot of unexpected things happened. All my friends and family were calling me, wanting to know what was going on, but something else happened too. I suddenly became very popular with women. I started going out with women who were younger than me, full of energy and excitement, something I hadn't experienced much in recent years. The constant complaints and negativity from Vera were now replaced with exciting dates, affectionate text messages, and attention from women who were just looking to have a good time. A month after that post, I met Cheryl, who would later become my wife. We hit it off and became a couple soon after my divorce with Vera was official. Vera wasn't happy when she found out about my new life. She was mostly mad at herself but also jealous and upset that I didn't give her a second chance before moving on. I refused all her attempts to meet up and only dealt with her through our lawyers. Eventually, we sold the house. After paying off the real estate agent and other selling costs, there wasn't much money left over, less than $11,000 in equity. I decided that Vera should have that small amount. 
The lawyers worked hard to get a share of my future earnings, but the court decided that they couldn't base the settlement on what I might earn later. Instead, they used my average income to figure out how much I should pay. Since Vera had a job, paying alimony wouldn't be too hard. In the end, I agreed to give her $2,000 a month for two years. It wasn't a huge amount, but it was enough to help her get by until she could stand on her own again or until she found someone else, which clearly wasn't going to be me. In the years that followed, Vera and I never spoke directly, only through our lawyers. She moved to Chicago where she joined a support group and eventually started living with Dr. Clayton, whom she had grown close to. She wasn't the same happy person she had been with me, realizing too late the cost of her actions driven by anger and selfishness. She knew what my reaction would be but still made a poor choice. She hadn't been intimate with Clayton that night, but she acted without regard for our marriage, as if she was single again. At our daughter's graduation three years later, Vera met my new wife, Cheryl, who was 28 and pregnant, and our one-year-old daughter, Jolene. Vera, now 47, looked much older, and Dr. Clayton, who came with her, stayed back sensing the situation. Later, Vera managed to speak to me alone. She wanted to apologize, regretting her actions and the life we could have continued to share. She acknowledged the mistake of risking our perfect life for nothing. I told Vera I had forgiven her. While I never expected to find her in someone else's arms, I thanked her for the good times we had, our two wonderful daughters, and the love we shared. Vera's actions, as painful as they were, led me to Cheryl and starting a new family, which helped me move past my anger. I advised her to focus on her future, assuring her that our past was behind us. I wished her well and expressed hope to see her at future family events. At that moment, Cheryl joined me with our daughter in her arms, and I took the opportunity to introduce them to each other. The difference in their ages was clear to see. Vera, at 47, could easily have been mistaken for Cheryl's mother. This realization made Vera regret even more the choices. She made decisions that led her to lose the love of her life over a single night of anger and selfishness. Over the following decade, our paths crossed again at our daughter's weddings. Vera remained unmarried but continued her life with Clayton, who was kind to her. However, seeing me with my new family and our young daughters stirred up old, fond memories for her. The joyous moments we once shared were now relegated to mere memories for her, leaving her to dwell in regret for the love and happiness lost due to unforeseen circumstances. That particular summer, after selling my stock options, I seized the opportunity to reclaim our old family home as soon as it resurfaced on the market. Everyone in our circle, except Vera, rejoiced at the prospect of once again owning the house that held countless cherished memories. My daughters, in particular, delighted in revisiting the place and reminiscing about their childhood in that nurturing environment. It's a pity Vera opted for a different path, she would have treasured continuing the life we had envisioned together. Nonetheless, life progresses, and I'm embracing the chance to forge new memories with Cheryl and our daughters. It's a valuable lesson learned, think twice before causing harm to someone, as you may find yourself in need of them in the future.